call. Um, but just a little quick introduction again. Um, so my name is, I, call me James, I go by Jim um, and other names at times. Um, I am privileged to be with you guys for about the last 10 years I've been in the nonprofit sector. And, but prior to that, well prior to that was on the sidelines of and on the field with the game of soccer. So um, I coached at our select premier level for the club in my community here in Tennessee. Uh, U11 and U17 girls. I don't know what I would do if I was asked to coach boys. Um, I have sons, but I've not coached them. It's a whole different thing. Um, and prior to that, I spent 10 years as an NCAA soccer official, um, just being out in the middle of and enjoying it. And prior to that, I played athletically at Carson Newman University. So it's fun to stay around the game. I was telling Kathy and Mark before we you jumped on, how much everything has changed now as I've been working on this material a little bit and just digging into it. Uh, my activity on the sidelines or in the club where I serve has just been radically changed. I, I can't look at it as a typical soccer club with parents, with coaches. There are obligations that we have. There are board of directors. There are privileges beyond what we usually realize for nonprofit leadership. But you all are a part of nonprofit organizations that do soccer. And so tonight, we just want to talk about that from the governance side for the board of directors. And so um, what I'm going to try to do is give us an opportunity to have a lot more discussion than the last time. If you're on that call, I had a lot of content. I, I was sharing my screen. I don't want to do that this time. Um, so you have something printed before you, but you don't even need that. I want to see if we can dialogue as necessary. So if you have questions, write the chat. You can even interrupt and speak. That's fine. Um, but before we jump in the board directors, I've got two rather uh, heavy quotations here on this sheet. So you can listen or you can read along with me. Um, I read an article uh, today from back in 2018. Here's the title of it. Is the nonprofit model for youth soccer clubs fatally flawed? I don't think it is. You all are all nonprofits. I think there's wonderful privilege to it. But this, this will help us get started with the burden of why this is important. Uh, this is from uh, Ruth Nicholson. There is a pervasive conflict of interest that's inherent in how we have structured our boards of directors in youth sports. Boards of directors are largely comprised of people who are also the clients and sometimes the employees of our clubs. Sometimes board members are parents of players in the club, sometimes they're coaches. When our roles and skills overlap, we create danger zones for conflict of interest and playing out of our position. When acting in the role of the board member, the role is club leadership, financial policy and governance or, and personnel, excuse me. The board role is not design, designing the details of the coaching program. That's a DOC or a coach's role generally. Um, small clubs may be a little different, I understand that. Advocating for an individual team or a player is a coach or a parent role. Lobbying for a specific team training field or practice time may be an operations or admin role. The question is not if there is a conflict of interest. Typically the question is, when that conflict of interest will arise for an individual board member who's also a parent, coach, staff, or volunteer, and how will it be handled? I actually sent this to our board of directors for the club I'm a part of and basically got some cheering, clapping hands in the background saying, um, this is our challenge. This is what makes governance so hard is a lot of us are wearing different hats and the conflict of interest is not necessarily financial in the realm of what you might think of most often in the nonprofit world, but it is, it is the, the organizational, uh, a parent is a client, so to speak. They may also, I'm, I'm a client as a parent of a player in my club. I'm also a coach who's an employee of the club, and I'm not on their board of directors, but I've been asked to consult with them. But if I were, those are just different hats that I wear, and I have some in, inherent challenges in that makeup. So I want you to feel the burden of what we're gonna talk about tonight. Um, another quote here, same, same author. I found Ruth Nichols stuff to be very helpful. Her organization is called uh, Nichols, NicholsonFacilitation.com. You've got it there. She's got a whole section on youth sports, dominantly youth soccer, which I just found to be helpful. Um, one of the major, most dangerous phrases heard in the soccer community is that quote, soccer people need to make soccer decisions. It perpetuates negative assumptions and reinforces the walls of distrust between people who need to work together on the off-field team. That's kind of what she's calling the board of directors and your stakeholders, the off-field team of adults that are needed to provide critical support for coaches and players. Board members and director of coaches play different roles as soccer people. The governance role filled by the board of directors is responsible for strategic direction, program priorities, policies, finances, personnel management, I would add risk management, 
the DOC and coaching roles are responsible for the quality of delivering the soccer program using their expertise in the sport. When either plays out of position, it triggers conflict and organizational dysfunction. So what we're gonna talk about tonight, we won't get into DOC roles. I realize your clubs may be smaller size, larger size, they could have different makeups. Um, in fact, I was in Greensboro at a college showcase event this past weekend. I mean, that's a massive club. Is it the Fusion, I think? And I don't know if anyone's here from that, but there are some huge clubs in, in all the states. There are small clubs. Um, so there's gonna be different ways in which this connects, but the issue is paramount that a board of directors knows how to um, govern. Let me give an illustration that happened just this past week. Um, and I wouldn't say this if I had anyone from our club on the call. Uh, the director of coaches pulled me aside. He was very distressed. And he had a situation of, uh, it was actually a parent situation for one of the teams that he coaches. Um, and on the team that he's coaching, it's not just this particular parent, but also three board members whose children are on that particular team. And our club is growing. We're working on ways in which the board can do governance and the coaches can coach and the parents can parent and the players can play. A parent functionally violated multiple parts of the parent code of conduct, which I just tried to be a, a listening board and say, hey, how'd you handle it? What's the situation? Because you are also the coach and the DOC. So he's got different hats he's wearing. And then I said to him, I said, question, is the person that gave you a challenging phone call that crossed all sorts of lines, is that the manager of the team as well? To which he said, yes. To which I looked at him and I just said, hey, listen, you have to decide if you're going to respond to this as a counselor and try to comfort a parent who's upset. You have somebody who's gone out of their lines and violated a parent code of conduct, but more than that, is this how a manager of a team in this club can directly pursue their frustration as a parent to the director of coaching? You're, you're conveying to me that there may be leverage, at least you assume there could be leverage among board members because they are, have a vested interest in how this team handles a complex situation. So how it all worked out is not the important thing. The issue is governance impacts process and the board of directors are gonna have conflicts of interest arise because they're probably serving the club because they love what's going on. They want their kids to be involved. They want to see it be a good experience for as many as are possible. So I, I basically just wanna share those quotes and that story to say what we're gonna talk through tonight on the financial side and on the risk management side is uniquely for board of directors who see their role as governance, not just as facilitating the soccer or whatever happens out on the field. Um, so if you have notes in front of you, I'll go through it. Again, you don't have to. What's a board of directors? I hope you know this, but I took this right off of the National Council of Nonprofits. Very basic definition. Board members are the fiduciaries. Well, that means they're those who have a shared legal and ethical relationship of trust with the organization. And they oversee the organization toward a sustainable future. And it's their job to adopt sound governance and financial management po po policies by sound ethical, legal, uh, practical, and they also must make sure that the nonprofit has adequate resources to advance its mission. So usually what happens is the board of directors feels the burden to make sure the resources are there so the mission can succeed for whatever it is that the mission is, and they're different for every club. But the first half of that is incredibly important. There are legal and there are ethical governance and financial obligations that because a board member is a fiduciary, that takes paramount position in addition to trying to make sure the organization has the resources needed to fulfill its mission. So I'd love to do a few questions that might get you all talking. You can type into the chat if you're more comfortable with that, but I, and whether I'm looking at your face on video or you're just listening in, um, I'm curious if you as a board member uh, would be willing to share, what are the most dominant things you spend your time doing? It may depend on the size of your club. And how might someone from your board answer if you're not sure what you would say? We spend a lot of our time going over the same things. I don't know that we ever progress forward. Uh, um, and when we do make decisions, there's nobody actually giving honest feedback. Everybody just agrees. We're a board of yes, ma'am, yes, sir. Okay. By saying things, are you talking about? Um, month after month, we're going over the same topics month after month. Okay. 
Can you give an example of um, one of those same talks, maybe the one that drains you the yeah. most? So fields, we've been okay. going over fields and while some of the field stuff needs to be gone over every month, some of it is redundant. And it would be nice if we could just move past the redundancy and get other stuff done. Okay, good example. Other things? I felt like that um, when I was on the board. Um, since then, I have transitioned to a, a director of operations role. So in, in talking with the board members and when I took this role on, um, you know, it was realized that, you know, they're volunteers. They have a lot of things going on, you know, personal life and work and, you know, besides this. So that's why they brought me on to, to become the director of operations so I could take a lot of the stuff off their plate. And then yeah. during our board meetings, I advise, we make quick decisions, and then we move on. So Excellent. that has helped us move on uh, tremendously. So we're not, like you said, stuck on the same things every month. You know, we ha I collect during the month all the information. I get everything together. I present the plan to the board. They make the decisions that they need to be making, and then we move on. I mean, our meetings don't go past an hour every month. So Excellent. we're keeping the club going forward. So I, that part I, I found um, to be a lot more helpful, um, just sharing responsibilities. And then, you know, I do a lot of the legwork and grunt work, and then I present them the options, here are the choices, make a decision, and then we move on. That's so. good. So there's a structural change that enabled that, Dennis, right? Yeah. Because prior to that, you would say that you all were just, uh, there were tons of tasks that might've been the, either in the weeds or just the operational day-to-day, -day, which would obligate the board to some of probably what Kristen's saying, just the over and over repeat of things. Yep, yeah, we get stuck good. talking to the same things and then we decided we, a change needed to be made. So that's okay. what Anybody else? And then I'll move to the next question. This is helpful. We spend a lot of time on financials that partly may be due to COVID, but we, uh, Piedmont Soccer Alliance is connected with Kernersville Soccer Alliance and PTFC in the triad area. And PSA owns Phillips Park where PTFC plays. So you get a lot of interconnectedness, but we spend a lot of time with financials and trying to do park improvements where PSA is a recreation group and PTFC is select soccer. Okay. So that's always interesting, but it, I think that's a better place to spend your time. Yeah. Well, that's what I, the next question I was going to go to. So there's, what do you spend your time doing? And you all may have other things percolating in your head. Um, the question also is what, what, what do you spend your time governing? And I think what you just mentioned would be, that's a governance thing to talk finances, to talk about facilities and assets, and, and we'll get to safety and risk management on those fields, et cetera. Um, parking issues, COVID issues, all those things are governance to have policies put in place. Um, and depending on the size of your club, I know that a lot of board, you just mentioned it very well, Dennis, a lot of people are, are volunteers, they're busy. And the, especially in smaller clubs, a lot of the board members are not going to be grabbed because of necessary governance, either expertise or experience. They're going to be grabbed because they're the ones that line the fields. They're the ones that are there all the time. They're the ones that show that vested interest in the club being healthy. And so a lot of times the board of directors I've seen, certainly in the, the mid to small size clubs, there's a lot of doers that end up on the board. And that's fantastic. But it's not the same as doing governance. And so that's what we're gonna tap into. And you guys are already on that or you probably wouldn't be on this call. Um, what could we spend our time governing? That's another question, right? So there's the, what do you spend your time doing? What do you spend your time governing? And what could you spend your time governing? And so if you think of strategic direction, that's governance. You could spend every single session on that. There's finances. You, you could spend all your time on finances. There's, there's conflict in the realm of youth sports with parents and opinions and coaches and trials, and you could spend an immense amount of time on conflict management. So there's a, there's a number of things you could be addressing that I would say fall into the realm of governance, but we don't want the monotony. We don't want the, the repeat, rinse and repeat, same meeting over and over and over. We want to see progress toward our vision values. So um, the fourth question I put here just in a little bit of discussion mode is what I'd like to tap into tonight. What must we spend our time governing? So it's not the purpose of our session tonight, uh, but 
a board of directors is responsible for the vision and the values and the culture of the organization they're leading. That's what you're responsible for. Um, it's not something that needs to necessarily be rewritten, revamped every time, but as you, as you can imagine, all of your clubs are different, partly because of the geographical region you're in or partly because of the size of your community. But I would say your, your organization should be very different in part because you have different customized, contextualized visions and values of what you want to accomplish. Your board members need to know what those are. If you have a value of community service built into your organization for whether you have recreational, select or premier or ECNL or all the way up, right? Um, if community service is a value that you have beyond the soccer field, well then part of the board of directors governance obligations is to say, how are we ensuring that our teams and our code, that we develop that community service component beyond the soccer field? But if that's not a value or part of the vision that your, your club has, but your club's vision is mostly developing elite level college soccer players or whatever the case may be, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just a different organization, isn't it? It's a, totally, a totally different organization. Um, and so then you see, I wrote vision, values, and culture. We're not going to spend time on, on culture tonight, but the board of directors sets the tone of how people communicate in a club. What, is, what goes out in written form? Um, my biggest thing, which I'll touch on in risk management, is the lack of uniformity in soccer clubs. Leaving, we want to have room for the personalities of the of the player, uh, of the parents and the coaches, and each team ends up with their own feel. But there has to be some form of uniformity to say this is what it looks like to behave with the professionalism as well as the the values and the culture that we have in this particular club. And it doesn't take long for me on a sideline, at a showcase event or a tournament, to realize. A lot of that personality culture is left up to the individual coach who's going to be the one that's running that sideline. What does it look like for a board of directors to say, no, this is us and you're a part of that and we're going to train you, equip you and release you to be a part of that. But it's based on this vision and these values. So again, that's all governance stuff, but it's not what we'll spend our time on tonight. Um, the next thing that is governance stuff is, is results and measurables. Based on what your aim is, what your goals are, the culture you say, that you seek to, to establish, it's the board of directors obligation to be assessing with regularity, are we moving the needle toward those, toward those things? Um, and as I, when I first entered the nonprofit realm, if you, if you don't measure it, you can't sell it, right? Um, so if the, if the way you're measuring success is the number of youth involved, maybe it's the number of recreational players, maybe it's the number of teams or the number of premier level or the number of whatever the case may be, measuring what your data points are that you've established will indicate whether you're, you're, you're succeeding in pursuing your vision, that's a governance thing. We're not gonna talk about that in, in, in long form tonight. But so I would say that the things we must spend our time governing on, you've got vision, values, culture, and you've got results and measurables toward those goals. What we'll talk about tonight are the other two things that I think are just absolutely indispensable, financial governance and risk management governance. The reason we're going to hit those tonight, and it was kind of the theme that Kathy and I talked about, is because if we don't get these things right, an organization ceases to exist and can actually damage the community and have all the efforts and all the things that you want to represent be very quickly dismissed because of lack of fidelity in these areas. So tonight we're going to focus on financial management, risk management. Um, so if you have the PDF in front of you, this is moved to page two, uh, financial governance. Um, I just put down four statements. These are similar to some ones I shared at the last one, uh, the last talk I did. Um, financial governance commitments. We will follow all legal and financial requirements for a North Carolina nonprofit. I communicated with Kathy this week and she pointed me to some resources that she has. She could tell you more about what they are. She, I think she's under limitation to share them, uh, but there are resources for you as a North Carolina nonprofit, the amount of revenue that you have and what obligations you have in light of the size of your organization. If you have full-time employees, you must be doing this. If you, if you have revenue below this number, this is where you get some latitude and don't have to file this. And that. there are all sorts of legal and financial requirements of being a nonprofit. Uh, one example would be uh, there's currently a law right now kind of in discussion, it looks like, in the General Assembly of North Carolina to, to make it so it's a simpler process of annual reporting for every nonprofit. 
I didn't dig into that. I didn't read a lot about it, but it's it would be established starting in 2021. It's a governance obligation to be looking into what changes there are. Um, and there are, center, is it called the Center for North Carolina Nonprofits or something like that? Um, I think that Kathy, you're nodding, is that right? Yeah, so you can look into that. Um, just a 15 minutes of research for me a couple days ago, just to know that I wouldn't say anything stupid, uh, yielded more information than I could possibly try to summarize for different size nonprofit organizations. What must you do every year? What about your filing of your 990? All those things are there for your disposal, but that's one of your commitments as a board of governors. Um, secondarily, we will adhere to sound accounting principles. Again, you'll see a recommendation I have later to make sure that someone on your board is a CPA. I almost included a CPA on this call so they could answer your questions, but then I realized there's just too many questions that would be contextual for each of your clubs. That'd be not a good use of our time. Uh, but adhering to sound accounting principles, in other words, you know what that means for me? Get someone else to do it who understands those principles. It means I don't do it at all. I have someone tell me what to do. And when I was an executive director, I will make sure we follow that. That's governance, that's executive leadership, but I don't have to understand it, but I want someone who does to be helping us do it in the most integral as well as efficient possible way. Um, thirdly, we will have internal policies and systems of accountability and ensure that they're followed. There's your really important sentence. If you're gonna have systems of accountability and policies, you must follow them. There's such danger to having policies in place that we don't follow. And I'll, I'll give some examples of those in a second. Um, fourthly, we'll produce reliable and timely financial information to build public trust. If you track with us on these nonprofit webinars, public trust is integral to you existing, to all nonprofits, because we belong to the community. That's why it's set up in the governance structure that it is. But if the third webinar we'll do is gonna be about seeking other funding and, and diversifying revenue sources. I'm not sure how many of you are relying or, in, or benefiting from donations that come to you, maybe for scholarships of other athletes or just using that privilege of being a 501c3 where people can be giving to you, you know, and pursuing corporate grants, not just sponsorships and not just marketing, but they could sponsor things that you want to accomplish. The minute you start doing that, people will be all over your financial documentation and reporting. And to me, my rule of thumb when I became a nonprofit executive was if somebody asked for information, it's my obligation to make sure the staff that reports to me has accurate and accessible information at all times. Because if someone asks for something, I can spin it around and give it to them right away, the public trust increases. If I say, give me a few weeks and I'll get you that basic level of information, it's not hard for a for-profit corporation that wants to invest maybe thousands into our mission tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands to realize that's stuff that I should have access to immediately because we should be reviewing it regularly. Okay, so the ante goes up as you seek to diversify revenue sources and write grants and other things. So here's where I'd love to do some conversation. Um, recommendations just from me, I'll go through a few of them and we can discuss if there's things that you're trying as we mentioned earlier or things that you um, have questions about. Um, Include an individual uh, member with financial expertise on your board. I hope you have that. I hope you've done that. Um, if it's not possible in light of the resources you know you have, look for someone in your community that is a CPA or something and say, would you be a, a pro bono even counselor to us? Doesn't mean they have to keep your books. They can give guidance to you and you will be all the benefit for it. Someone that is used to working with the nonprofit community. I highly recommend that. If you're a large entity on your board, uh, if you're a large entity, there's wisdom to have a financial uh, committee of some kind or another so the board doesn't get caught in all the complexities of this. Um, establish and review written board approved financial policies. So control processes and procedures. Do you know who has, you know, for example, our club that we've got, um, every team manager has a debit card that's got the team fees. Everybody sets it up differently, I get that. Um, I'm not a team manager, I'm a coach, but if I travel, there's a per diem I'm allowed, there's all these different things that are part of our club's financial policies. Um, what are the control processes so that a team manager is being held accountable and there's not a long lag of time where an entire season lapses and then we review how that particular team handled their use of a debit card? Because 90 days is too long. 
says a father with two teenagers, right? We've got, we've got to be able to have some measure of control processes and procedures to protect not only the money that we are using and spending, because they belong to the public, um, but also protecting, protecting the individuals that have those, those freedoms and those cards. So that's an example. Um, another policy example, compensation review and reward, right? And actually, uh, if I'm not mistaken, when I reviewed some of the North Carolina nonprofit documentation, that's an obligation for nonprofits that have pay, paid staff, right? Especially that CEO, is there a review process? Is there a compensation comparison process by which your club has set that, uh, that financial package? So um, again, that's documentation you can look into. Conflict of interest policy. I don't have a good example of one. You may, and you can speak up, that's, that's written for a soccer club. Kathy, you all may have some, I'm not sure. I have, I have seen many for nonprofits and other sectors, but in light of our illustrations I read from earlier, what are some unique examples that might need to be in a conflict of interest statement for a soccer club? Particularly when your client are the families whose kids have soccer and most of the board members, especially in smaller clubs, are those clients. That's complicated. So what does a conflict of interest statement look like so that you can do that? By the way, that's required by law for nonprofits to have that for the board of directors. In South Carolina, we had to, or we chose to, I can't remember actually, but we had our, our board of directors sign it every year, just in case a new conflict of interest had developed in their world. Um, and then we kept it in the file of the board of directors in the event that we had an issue rise, rise up. Um, so some of these, these don't come from me, gift acceptance, whistleblower protection, confidentiality agreements, uh, document security, backup and destruction of files. Again, those are things you can access and find. But for me, when I was leading a nonprofit, about a million dollar nonprofit, once we started going for much larger pools of money, I would be asked in a grant document to check a box that said we had a conflict of interest statement and to please upload it. I'd be asked to check a box that says, do you have a whistleblower policy? Please upload it. So again, that that's very important, especially for you that are larger nonprofits, but especially as you see yourself wanting to grow in health, these documentation are needed, even if they're not being asked every year. So let me pause there and see if there's any questions or some of you may say, well, we got one of those policies and we could, you know, through Kathy or Mark, uh, allow others to see it as a sample. Um, any questions or comments? We have one for our board and our staff, but it's not specific to, to clubs. And that may be something that we probably should provide and maybe could help pull one together to, to get out to the clubs. Cause I do know we saw, we send those out on a yearly basis okay. to our executive board and which it's on my to-do list right now that it's time to send one out. One of the recommendations I'll give at the very end is to have an, uh, it's really the main recommendation is an annual um, board of directors kind of orientation and training again, even for those that have been on your board, especially if you've added new people. But if you have some of those documents that are just there in that packet of this is what we go over at the first meeting of the board of directors after a new elections happened, it will help you get the rhythm to make sure some of those documents are A, there for the new persons, but also perhaps renewed and revised or even um, re you know a review for those who have been around doing it for some time. I'd like to know, does anybody have, have a conflict of interest you're using locally? We have one it is not specific to soccer, but we do have a conflict of interest statement that our board members have to sign. Good. There's a lot of boilerplate ones out there, you know, and they would be satisfactory to, to keep yourself in legal conformity. I just, I'm just curious. I'm, I'm going to give some thought to it. Um, We are trying to develop one to use for the clubs. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Okay. So next bullet here on the recommendations is, is this is, this is basic. Um, and folks, if you were on the call last time uh, with me a couple months ago, 
I shared that when I was first hired to be an executive director of a, it was a home repair nonprofit. That's what, that's what we provided. It wasn't um, soccer or sports. It wasn't an association. Um, we relied almost hundred percent on donations from outsiders. So there were some reasons we had to navigate different types of, of things, but I was hired for two things. The organization was very concerned about financial management and, and revenue streams. And they were very concerned about risk management. And that was, they just said, this is your job for the first year. These are the areas we're most concerned. Um, and so this next item became a, a big deal of, we were a small staff and we still, we actually got some outside consulting help to help us think about how to segregate the duties of all major financial functions. Even if we had to bring a, a board member into the office to work with our staff to be the person that would help with this or that, because we had the same person that was opening donations in the mail that was filling out the bank uh, deposit slip and was driving those checks to the bank. This is when I got there. Um, and we said, well, that's, that makes sense. We've only got one administrator. We got one construction you know, manager and we've got the new guy, Jim, what does he know? Well, we had to fi figure out what to do to start segregating duties when we had not enough staff to properly segregate. So it's your obligation in the governance sense to do what you can, but it may require creativity to loop in someone else. Um, so probably in general, you all are not receiving a lot of donations, uh, like cash donations handed to you or checks and that. But I was thinking through uh, where might there be segregation of duties needed? Well, um, I saw plenty of concession stands open this past weekend at multiple sites throughout uh, Greensboro, Raleigh area where I was uh, watching my daughters play, right? So that's a small example of, is there segregation of duties in something so small as a concession stand under your club's oversight? Um, that's minor, that's tiny, but it's probably not. It could be attached to a significant amount of money. Uh, but but it's, it's, it's also not just about the money. It's about protecting those who are involved um, from any sort of accusation or any sort of infidelity. Um, so I don't know if there's other examples you could use where segregation of duties are needed in your realm. A, a lot of you are probably funded through the, you know, credit card or debit card payments on a regular basis from your, from individuals. Jim, one of the things that I've gotten calls about are, are some of our associations. Um, what's happened is one person has the money, deposits the money. That's the same person that collects the invoices writes the checks and yep. signs the checks. And unfortunately, some bad things had happened. Yep. So, you know, uh, there needs to be more than one person touching things. Yep. Um, just for the security of the, the association, plus the security of the person. There's an inherent second person, invisible person involved in as many things as our digital. In some regards, you could say that, right? Um, but if it's actually gonna be physical, Kathy, you're just touching on something. This is where things happen. Um, and so, you know, I had only been a nonprofit executive director for less than a year and I had my first situation where we had to terminate an employee because of fraud. Improper use of company credit card. Thankfully, we'd already employed all these backup plans because I was told by the board of directors, this is just absolutely, it has to happen yesterday. Right. And so we were I was keeping notes of the counsel I was giving to this individual. But ultimately, we we were so frequently checking. Credit card statements versus actual organizational expenses that we were able to catch things early on. Now, that employee was able to say, oh, that was an accident. That was an accident. Well, the accidents didn't stop. And so you had a situation where you had to to be more drastic. So um, this is just super important for you to protect your great employees or your great volunteers by not putting them in a position to be handling something by themselves. Yeah, um, we, we thought about that too. And then <clears throat> we try to mitigate as much, you know, handle our cash as we can. And, you know, we created, you know, PayPal accounts. Yep. So we kind of went to the digital age. You know, we have a Venmo account for our club where, you know, a lot of people are easier now to transfer money that way. And this way, you know, both both companies, you know, they have this setup for business for, for Venmo and PayPal has setups for nonprofits for donations where, you know, whoever's making the donation automatically gets a receipt for that for their tax deduction. And 
you know, we we try to eliminate have almost zero cash exchanging on oh, hand. So that's just something that you know a lot of people are used to that yep. having their phones out there and scanning stuff and transferring money that way. So we just hopped on board, and that that drastically reduces the number of potential um, for an issue for for anybody. That's excellent. An example for us would be that there's an allotment that our club has established for what a coach's hotel can be. Um, and so if either the costs due to that tournament are just too high or uh, um, I, have, I have six children. And so there's times in which the hotels, I need to get two rooms, right? Um, unless I can get the hotel that my family's staying at to give me a big suite, which then bumps it above the amount. And so the club will Venmo me the maximum amount they're allowed, but I must send them a receipt of my paying for a room that's more expensive than the maximum amount they're allowed to give. Because what if I am actually staying at my brother's house for free and I want that extra money? All right, um, now I'm not gonna get into specifics of all that, but those are examples of just having accountability set in place. And then the critical thing, and we'll, we'll jump past this for now for time's sake is, there's gotta be either a financial, committee of the board, or it can be someone that's internal on the staff as Dennis is chief operations officer there. But what does it look like to have someone review these things, not just have policies set up? They have to be reviewed. That's where things are caught. That's where people are protected. Okay. Um, I wrote, this is what I meant by uh, reviewing it, build into the executive director or a CEO, or maybe you just have a, a, a volunteer that's over finances in your small organization. Write in specific expectations of financial accountability that will be shared with the board of directors. It's that person's job, job obligation. As I mentioned earlier, when I was hired to serve as an ED, my background is in ministry. I've been a pastor, okay? I'm not an accountant. My dad was a businessman, but I'm not an accountant. So the first thing that I did is look for a person who was gonna overhaul all that we did financially to be clean and good in all that we did and then I got that person to develop systems to tell me how to make sure they were followed and give me the idiot's guide to presenting them to the board of directors so that I could give them what they needed because they needed to have it. But the regular reporting back to the board can take many different forms. Kristen, you're talking about going over the same things over and over. I think sometimes if we get caught in that, that sort of a rhythm where we're not getting to the creative things required to help us grow the club, there's probably a need for some other pathway to have the conversations that are taking most time, right? So it may be that a finance committee is established that doesn't exist. You can bring in members at large from the community who have expertise, who could be the ones that receive things, saves your board of directors time and then they package them and present them to the board with their expertise, but they don't necessarily serve on the board because they don't have time or they're not the right people for the board. I just, you know, think of creative ways to free your board up to be successful in what you need to do, but you can't set this aside. Okay, I want to get to risk management. I'm aware of our time, so I'm not going to say a ton. We've already hit it a little bit, but credit debit cards. Do you have cardholder agreements for those who have credit cards or debit cards? That would be critical. That's in the packet annually for review for staff members, just like there might be a conflict of interest document, document for board members. Um, monthly review of statements is critical or more frequent, however you do it. Uh, team manager use of funds. Are there policies for how a team manager can use funds? Is there training on how to do it? Are there checks and balances built in? Again, uniformity, I think, is a risk management issue, depending on the size of your club, where you have that many different people that are doing something that is supposed to be uniform. Um, okay, so turn to the next page. Uh, if you got it, risk management is that other area that I think is just a must. It must be done. So let me read these statements and then we'll jump into some discussion about um, different recommendations and categories. We will ensure the ethical integrity of the organization entrusted to our care. That should be, that's, that's part of you being a fiduciary or anybody else being a fiduciary. They have legal trust given to them associated with the an organization. So therefore integrity is built into the job description and obligation. Uh, I've already said this, we will seek uniformity in establishing clear expectations for all representatives of our club. We will review the performance of all representatives of our club. Now, what I mean by that is not that it's a long drawn out. I, I hate I hate job reviews. I hate them. I hate them. I hate them. I've always felt like if I have good employees who love working here, they feel like every day there's affirmation of what they're doing well and every day we're making each other better but there's still benefit to sit down specifically if you're obligated to, to give the 
review to your board of directors or whatever the case may be, there's benefit toward reviewing the performance versus job description. And I think what it protects is the uniformity of a club. I'm not gonna throw my club under the bus. I think I do okay job as a coach. I'm not the best soccer coach. I'm, I feel like I'm a decent leader. The parents seem to be really happy. Um, but guess what? Nobody's ever asked me or reviewed my performance based on the expectations of what they've asked me to do. Nobody. Happy parents. Nobody touches it. The, then the teams that get all the attention and all the time are when there's some sort of a conflict or some sort of a relational challenge. But you can mitigate that if a club realizes we're gonna have some kind of review for the responsibilities given to a person that's filling a particular role, coach, manager, whatever the case may be. Um, thirdly, uh, or fourthly, uh, we'll protect the organization for the good of the community. Protection and safety is the essence of risk management. That will include protecting individual players and parents, coaches and managers, staff and board members, and I think also the network stakeholders that care about what you're contributing to the community. In other words, protecting your reputation that somebody else is investing in or cares about. Um, so recommendations, I'll jump through this, interrupt me if you want, or we'll still make sure there's time to talk toward the end. Safety is everything. I think safety is just the essence of what a nonprofit does. Um, we don't make widgets. We produce something in the realm of soccer. We want to produce great, great athletes that know how to play a game that's beautiful but also we have to we have to care for the persons that come along our way and so you probably have that built into your values and vision but safety physical safety mental health safety and i think certainly being aware of the safety of minors physical abuse sexual abuse i know we sign all those things we watch the videos as coaches but do you have policies in place in which you're protecting the safety that's risk management example where we play, uh, COVID-19 has made it so we just can't train in the winter, like the early part of the win spring, winter. Uh, we can't play on grass. The, gra the grass fields that our club has access to are just, they're just water. They're awful. They're beautiful in the spring. They're Bermuda grass. It's amazing. But prior to that point, they're just a disaster. So we usually rent facilities that are AstroTurf. But because of COVID-19, none of those schools would rent their fields to us. So we did the best we could to go find corners of the fields to play on in the outdoor facilities that we usually don't train on in the winter. Well, there's two bathrooms and one of the bathrooms is way on the far side of the complex. And it's the only one that the city is allowing to be open right now because the other one has had frozen pipes in the winter. So they're not gonna turn the water on until middle of March or April, early April. Which means some of our clubs, kids are training a 10 minute walk, it feels from the bathroom, five to 10 minute walk. Again, no one meant to do anything wrong, but they said, we're gonna have the golf cart to take kids to the bathroom should they have need. I sat down with my little girls, my U11 team that I coached and said, here's the deal. If one of you has to go to the bathroom, you got one of our club representatives gonna drive you to the bathroom, but I'm gonna send two or three of you to the bathroom, even if you don't have to go to the bathroom. But what if we don't, coach, what if we'd rather play and, and do the shooting drill? I don't care. You're going to go to the bathroom because I'm going to ask you to go to the bathroom with one of your teammates that has to go to the bathroom because I'm not going to put one child on a golf cart with one adult and send them across this complex and back. It's not my job to say that. It was the job of the club to tell us, here's how we're going to do this over these difficult winter weeks because COVID's changed everything. All right. So safety is everything. As you know, COVID protocols, that's safety, right? That's health. That's public health. And you have obligations in North Carolina, just like in Tennessee, but differently, uh, to do certain things as a club to protect people's health. And so th that's documentation that you need to be looking up and you can do. Um, so there's safety, there's protecting your facilities and your physical assets, you know, uh, protecting the equipment that's yours, making sure that the goals are anchored. All those things are risk management. Um, COVID-19, it's an example of public health risk management. Um, risk management is building into your job description as well as your functioning as a board, how you're gonna hold your, your chief person accountable for what they say they'll do. Whoever that person is, it might be a, an executive director, a director of coaching, a chief executive officer, a COO, whatever the title is, 
who's at the top that reports to the board, that person needs to be given support, but also know that they're, they're going to be reviewed, that they help the club fulfill its risk management obligations. They are putting in place safety procedures. Um, some of this we've already talked about. Legal is existence, that's risk management. You have to have your annual gen general meeting. You have to function like a non nonprofit and file an annual report. Um, as I said the last talk, I'm a pastor of a church also. If we fail to have our annual meeting where we have to elect trustees, even though they don't do much during the year, but we just have to elect it because the state of Tennessee requires us to, if something ever were to happen, something bad, I would hope it wouldn't, but something bad, and we haven't acted like a nonprofit, it's not hard for someone to pierce that corporate veil and say, we're going after the individuals in your organization because you're not acting like a nonprofit. We can't have the nonprofits as profits insurance cover you because you're not being a nonprofit. You didn't do the basic legal things that you're required to do to be a nonprofit. So legal existence, those things are incredibly important. Um, insurance is important, that's risk management. Financial segregation of duty, that's risk management. Um, cultural uniformity, I think that's risk management. I was, I was with somebody this last spring break on vacation. They're not involved with any team that I'm involved in, but they said, you know, we're pretty sure that when our coaches had such and such coach, he came to practice inebriated. We're pretty sure he did. What is that? What, what, really? That's not something to laugh about. This is, this is children we're talking about. This is a club's reputation. This is, so there's got to be some measure of coaching behavior or manager communication that is just so written into the culture of the organization that your board of directors sees it as risk management to make sure those expectations are there, the training is there, and checking in to see that it's happening is there. Or else, if you have 50 teams, if you're large, or 20 teams, or whatever, they're all going to form their own little culture in their own team, and there's just too many kids, there's just too much going on to be able to police that on a day-to-day -day basis, so there has to be a system of review. I think that's all risk management. And then finally, uh, this is probably kosher to you all. You're very aware of it, but social media has changed a lot. Do you have policies for social media? What is and isn't to be shared on behalf of pictures of people? All that stuff is risk management so your organization can function. Um, and then the last one I have there is just a, a recommendation for conversation is travel. I, again, a lot of your club soccer teams are traveling all over the region. I travel with a team. I understand the financial ways in which I'll have a per diem and this, that, and the other. No one's ever talked to me, not once, about performance representing the club on the road. When I'm on the road and I'm in a hotel and I'm with my team, whether the U17 team or the U11 team, I don't represent me. I don't represent my family. I represent the club. I think that's risk management. That's reputation management. That's consistency and uniformity. And you all have been in those hotels where you see one group of people that looks like they're having a frat party and it's just actually soccer parents and soccer kids. And you have the other coach that's saying, everybody has to be in bed by nine o'clock. You're not allowed to swim. You can't have fun. I don't really care which way it goes, but again, that's left up to the culture that that individual team forms. There are people that have the badge on the jackets or the shirt that you give them. What does it look like to see travel as something for which we need some risk management procedures or at least discussions about? Because that's when your brand for your organization is out in the community and out in the state. So um, I'm throwing a lot at you, but I've been just trying to think through categories without just dumping content and all sorts of things on top of you. So um, questions or anything like that? It's been very helpful. Thank you. Wonderful. You've thrown a lot at me, so I don't currently have my thoughts together to get questions to you, but I'm sure that later I will have lots of questions. I know that myself and one of our um, staff members is on here, so I'm sure she and I will be putting Great. some thoughts together. 
for sure. You're welcome to reach out to me. Um, I, I want to be available. I'm learning with you. Uh, youth sports and association type nonprofits are not areas where I've spent a ton of my time, but I, I spend three nights a week out on a soccer field with you uh, just in a different location. And I think it matters that we do this well. Hey, Kathy, this is Art. Um, you saw those two questions from I'm Ray. I'm just now looking at them. Tim Rayworth. Yes. Um, so I think I think there's there's some websites out there for competitive pay analysis. I'm pretty sure that either you at United Soccer Coaches has done something in that role. I don't I don't know that USYS has. I don't know. I mean, I would totally submit to what maybe NCYSA has seen. Uh, thank you for that art. I, I know where to find it. It's not hard to find if you're in other sectors of nonprofit realm because it just has a lot to do with the size of the organization, revenue, right? And or number of staff. And you just look at comparables uh, in your region, you know, so it has a lot to do with geography. Right. Um, and so, it, you know, it's not apples to apples for sure, but especially knowing that, you um, that resources out there on U.S. soccer or something like that. I, I think it'd be worth an investigation. Kathy, have you seen anything? I haven't seen anything. Okay. I think it's a great question, though. We so have such a, we have such a, a huge distance in what some are being paid versus others in the yeah. state. So I love this question too, uh, Tim, you had two questions. The second one is if coaches are independent contractors, how would you structure coach behavior policies to maintain that separation? Well, with, with all the nonprofits for which I do, I am a, I'm an independent contractor. Um, and if I have a situation different than what I'm doing with you all, you all, this is more like I'm just enjoying conversations and Kathy and I have an arrangement of what's the goal of these things and Jim needs, I need to deliver on that. Okay, that's simple. But with the other nonprofits that I serve every single day or every single week with, I've just got sort of a retainer built in of what my obligations are for them, for the role that I'm doing. I'm mostly doing development work and, and philanthropy stuff, um, corporate grants and such. So if I'm doing that, it would be well within their realm to ask me to sign a contract that if you're going to work with us, this is the behavior expectations that we have for those who work with us. Yeah, so you definitely we, need to have a, a defined scope of work yeah, working on what the expectations are um, and what the results you want to have. Yep. And I would say most, I mean, I, would all you affirm this, that most of the coaches that I've been around are, we're all independent. I'm an independent contractor when I help coach. It's no different than any other independent work that I do, but um, it's the only area where I'm paid 1099 income where I didn't agree to some sort of expectations of how I will be behavior wise or even time wise. And I'm not, I'm not trying to throw my club under the boat, uh, under the bus, but I lived in South Carolina before Tennessee and I've never signed anything, even though I've received a small remuneration for the work that I've done as a, as a club level coach that's got licensing for USSF. So our coaches are um, considered contract and part-time, but they are on my ADP payroll. So they do not get 1099s. I give them a, a regular payroll. Great. But they are considered independent contractors. And you also have to be careful with independent contractors and what you write up because of the control, because of how that's interpreted under a, under the subcontract. Right. Don't be shy. Uh, if I could just throw like one little, I, I do development. That, that's my area where I've enjoyed nonprofit work the most. It's in fundraising. So we'll have more fun when we get to that talk in a few months. But um, all this stuff terrifies me. It did when I first started doing it. Like, what if we mess up? What if we do this wrong? And then it started to convict me. And it should convict board members that if we don't do this, who will? And we live in a world where deception's real, where things happen, circumstances change. There's got to be a body of leaders who are thinking through how a great organization with a great vision is going to adapt as well as hold its integrity together. Um, but what I have found is in the nonprofit realm, we, do, we believe in the nobility of what we do, most of us, or we wouldn't be involved in it. The nobility can cause one of two reactions. One is we dismiss the harder things because we love doing what we think is most important and it makes us feel best and it actually is really good to invest in kids or whatever the case may be. It's wonderful work, 
but the wonderful work can't cause a board of directors just to not do what are the, is the mandatory work. That's the risk. The nobility causes us to cloud our judgment. But the other side of it is because it's so noble, I think there's a real value to asking community leaders around you for help more than most non most soccer clubs probably do. If you, if you, if you change the grid that you're a nonprofit, not a soccer club that's for profit, it will change a lot. In other words, I would have no problem going to a CPA or somebody and saying, Hey, the nonprofit club that I'm about, I know you're busy. You probably don't want to be a board member, but would you be willing to be a part of an advisory council for financial and governance for this nonprofit? And you can, you know, I'm asking you to do it either gratis or just check over our stuff once every 90 days, make sure we've done it properly because we're going to develop systems, but we need help. There will be people that need to say no because they literally can't take on anything else, but lean into the nobility of what you're doing and those vision, those values, and those kids that you're investing in. And, and I would look outside the realm of your board if you feel like some of these things are just too heavy. There are people that might do it as an in-kind donation of their time because it is their area of expertise and they care about the community that you're in. So lean into the nobility. Don't be too shy at the same time. Nonprofits don't want to beg, borrow, and steal and not respect other people's time. So it, it's sort of a dance, right? Um, last thing I'll say, and then uh, you all can wrap up, Kathy and Mark. Um, I, I failed to just mention this. Um, if you were to, oh, well, it's at the end, the, the, the recommendation of, um, having those clear individual and collective board of director expectations, something that I would recommend you do once a year. If they're not written yet, it, you could ask a small committee of the board to say, Hey, let's build, let's write a document for us. That's customized for us. It's not, a, it's not a boilerplate document. It's for us. What are our expectations of one another? What are our expectations of, of all of us together? What are we going to review with regularity coming up with something? There's plenty of examples out there. But if you did a once a year onboarding for new board members, but also review for regular board members that include some of these basic components, just purely over the course of two or three years, you will grow in health and in doing wiser governance because it's now in front of you. What that will protect you from, and I think this is just the biggest risk in leadership, is if I'm taking my, an organization I'm leading this direction, I generally avoid like the plague people that I know want to go this direction. They're not on our board or they're not involved. They're, they're just, they're not involved. I don't want them to be involved. What usually happens is people that are going in the same direction as I, as I want us to go in. We think we're saying the same thing and going in the same direction, but if we are just a few degrees off in the first quarter of the first, you know, whatever series of meetings we have as a board, a year goes by, maybe they're on a three year term, Conflict and trial starts to happen when, as the continuum of time pushes forward, those who thought they were on the same page and then realize over the course of time they're not, they end up further and further away. And there meets the trial that causes a lot of the conflict of interest and stresses that we mentioned at the beginning of the call. So it is a governance risk management activity for the board of directors to say, which direction are we headed in? What does accountability look like? And are we all on the same page? And if you're not doing that with your board of directors, once a year at least to make sure here's what we mean by this, 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 and this. You run the risk of having to either always put out a fire uh, or finding out well past the fire is just an absolute inferno that somebody is actually seemingly to be against the organization that you thought all along they were with you. So that's just an important element. It's proven true in my leadership over the years that I've been in volunteer driven leadership of who looks like they're on board, but no one ever described their role or has held them accountable for if they're fulfilling it. So that's my encouragement and sort of a challenge along these lines. Well, I'm good, Kathy, Mark. I mean, I want to stick to an hour so we don't exhaust people. But if you think of stuff, I've got my information on that page that, that uh, is in the link. And if I can help in any way, in simple ways, um, I'd be happy to try. Jim, thank you. I was enlightened tonight. Yes, and if anybody you. has any questions for 
or us at the state office, um, it's easy as Kathy at ncsoccer.org. It's great. Um, I don't have them in front of me, but April 21st and May 9th are the other two nights that we've kind of got on our calendar for right now. One of them is going to be about actual job descriptions and roles uh, from your director of coaching or your, exec your, your operations officer all the way down to your coaches, your managers, down to volunteer level. What would it look like to have healthy job descriptions and maybe even a flow of accountability? And then the last one, that we'll do for this spring is going to be diversifying revenue streams and using that nonprofit status you, you have to be healthy in, um, and not just necessarily relying on one stream exclusively. So we'll try to talk through that. And I just posted the link to the page where we'll, we will link the zoom, uh, put the zoom link. All right. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, I, uh, I think everyone learned a lot and I, I do appreciate it. So thank you. You got it. Thank well, I'll look, look for me on North Carolina sidelines. I'm there. I'm there more often than I, than I realized I would be. So, and I enjoy it. So appreciate the work that you guys are doing. What you're doing is important. Um, whatever chair you sit in staff or board member, thanks for being on this call. Yeah, thank, thank you, you all for attending. All right. Good night. Good night. Good night.